can totally preach from here and it'll be fine. But I'm going to mute my microphone to avoid un any unnecessary feedback if for some reason the electronics decide what I'm saying is worth being heard. So, I don't know, this is a hard gospel today and part of me wonders if the electronics were telling us what our ears sometimes tell us, that we don't want to hear it when Jesus says hard things. I at least don't often want to hear it when Jesus says hard things. You know, the old saying that says something like, in polite company, we should never talk about religion or politics or money. Jesus never worried too much about keeping polite company, and he never shied away from talking about things that might make us squirm or want to pretend we can't hear what's being said. The harsh reality of our world, though, is sometimes we do want to close our ears, turn off the microphones or the speakers or the TV sets or the internet that's telling us the things that make us feel uncomfortable, the things we don't want to hear. This past week, an award-winning author, Salman Rushdie, was attacked and remains in critical condition um, when he, he was attacked when he was speaking at the Chautauqua Conference in upstate New York. We don't know yet exactly what the motives were that were um, behind the attack, but what we do know, of course, is that his writing over the past decades has been something that has made some people uncomfortable, leading to death threats coming as far up as the Ayatollah of Iran in the latter half of the past century. Well, there are many in our midst, particularly in this United States context, that speak and prize heavily the idea that words should not be censored, that thoughts and ideas should flow freely. The truth is there are lots of words and ideas, especially as Rushdie wrote about politics and about religion, that we don't want to hear. And although it would be easy enough to point fingers and say, well, I'm not like those people who are calling for censorship of books and school libraries, or I'm not like those people who are persecuting authors who write on controversial subjects, the reality is I just have different things I want to hear and not hear than the people who I would like to point fingers at. We all get a little cringy when somebody says something that doesn't match how we think about the world. When we went this summer on our vacation to up north to go see Yellowstone and the Badlands and all of these sorts of things, as we were leaving the Badlands and approaching the uh, Mount Rushmore monument, I started talking to my family in the car about all of the things that get me a little cringy when I think about the Rushmore Monument. I talked about the sculptor and his connections with white supremacy and American exceptionalism. And then in good Allen banter, my spouse started saying, well, I had said I thought he was a member of the Klan, and my spouse started saying, well, that might be going a little too far. And we were going back and forth until one of our kids said, would you stop arguing? And I paused and thought, I didn't think we were arguing. But we were having a really interesting conversation, the exchange of ideas, but they didn't feel that way. They were beginning to get uncomfortable, I think, by the topics that were being discussed. And the truth is, as much as I tried to tell them that this is just the free exchange of ideas, uh, those of you who followed our summer trip on Facebook may have noticed there wasn't a single picture of the Badlands on my Facebook feed. Uh, not the Badlands, the Badlands were there, of Mount Rushmore on my Facebook feed. Um, and that's because I didn't want to get into the dialogue of the, with the people who are on my Facebook feed one way or the other about what Mount Rushmore represents. It was a conversation I felt was best saved for our family van, and even there the tensions got a little high. Religion, politics, economics are tough to talk about if we want to maintain polite company. And so when Jesus comes to his disciples and says to them, you may think I came to bring peace, 
But I came to bring not peace, but the sword. I came to turn daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. I came to turn husband against wife, brother against father, and all of these family relationships being sort of tossed up. I get uncomfortable because I value family, and I value relationships, and I value Jesus. And I have a hard time imagining that Jesus would come to crumble away all those relationships. But I think that what he was trying to say, I think the message he wanted his disciples and us to hear, was not that family relationships were bad. It wasn't that I should stop talking to my mother-in-law now, just in case. It was that if we have these conversations with our children, with our parents, with our siblings, or aunts and uncles, or second cousins who live in another state, it could get uncomfortable. We may say things that they don't want to hear, and they may say things that we don't want to hear. We may have trouble understanding one another. We may even begin to feel like arguments are brewing. And in polite company, especially at family gatherings, we want to avoid those kinds of arguments, right? We want to keep everything nice and calm. And that's what Jesus is critiquing. Not the desire to be at peace or in good relationships with our families. But I think Jesus is critiquing those relationships that are based on a false calm. Those relationships that aren't willing to engage in that good-natured dialogue, that aren't willing to read the book that makes them feel uncomfortable and talk about what biblical womanhood means even if it means something different for all of the people gathered around the table. Jesus, as Jesus often does, is calling us into something deeper, into relationships with our friends and family and communities that aren't just based on not posting pictures of the cringeworthy sites, on not talking about the difficult topics, but are based on showing up when our Islamic brothers and sisters are making a petition to the community council. Showing up when our school boards are discussing what books and curriculums ought to be in our libraries and in our schools. Showing up when a sibling in our own family says they don't understand all this pronoun stuff. Showing up when implicit racism threatens to pull our communities apart. Deep, meaningful, loving relationships are about being willing and able to have those hard conversations. And so Jesus says, I came not to bring peace, but the sword. And my kids aren't here today because William's receiving a Bible at the church across the street. And so as we were talking about Bibles and Bible stories this morning at breakfast, my father asked my son what, what his favorite Bible story was, and he said in typical second grade fashion, I really like the one where the soldier cuts that guy's ear off. <laughs> Thinking about my sermon for this morning, I said, well, I shouldn't say, my father was quick to remind him that Jesus put it back on. Um, but then, thinking about my sermon for this morning, I said to William and my dad, I said, Jesus must have forgotten what he said earlier about I've come not to bring peace but the sword. And my father said, I think Jesus was talking about a different kind of sword. As much as I was trying to rankle everyone at the breakfast table, I think he's right. The kind of sword that Jesus is talking about in today's text isn't the kind of sword that comes out swinging at the closest Roman officer who may threaten your own safety. The kind of sword Jesus is talking about in today's text is a tool. It's the same kind of tool we hear about in the Hebrew Bible reading that we had a little bit earlier, the fire that is meant to purify. It's the same kind of tool Jesus talks about at the end of the text when he imagines all of the ways in which we are beginning to see the signs of God entering into our world. In lieu of sharp knife metaphors, maybe we could think of it as a scalpel. A tool designed to cut out those fears, those insecurities, those inclinations towards avoidance 
rather than saying the tough things to love our neighbor more deeply. Jesus didn't come to bring a surface peace. Jesus came with a scalpel, not aimed at the other, by the way, but aimed at himself, at his own followers, at his own community, so that we might take that same scalpel and look closely at our own hearts and ask what it is that we need to cut away in order to really and truly love those whom we want to keep company with and those who we may hesitate to keep company with, but whom God calls us to love as our neighbors just the same. Jesus came to proclaim a gospel that sadly does in our human, mixed-up world sometimes put families against families. Sons against fathers, daughters against mother-in-laws, brothers against sisters. But his goal isn't to keep us that way. God's goal, as has been from the very beginning of creation and continues in today, is to create a beloved community where we can have the hard conversations together. And as we grow deeper in community and love for one another, maybe at some day when the signs come to fulfillment, there won't be any hard conversations left to have because the love of God will fill all of us in totality. Thanks be to God that Jesus comes not to bring peace, but God's word. Amen.